Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is John Lustria. I'm the Education Coordinator with the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, and I'm thrilled to be joined today by Nathan Marzoli, the Staff Historian for the Air Net National Guard. Uh, welcome, Nathan. Thanks for having me, John. Um, and we're going to be uh, interviewing Nathan about one of his, uh, Nathan is a man of many talents, but uh, <laughs> critically for us, um, Nathan is one of our esteemed blog authors. And with the anniversary of the Battle of Chancellorsville coming up, we're going to talk to him a little bit about his blog post about medical care uh, in the aftermath of the battle. Uh, but before we do that, just want to give a, another reminder with the museum being closed during the, the COVID-19 crisis, uh, we rely so much on those of you who have been watching these videos, uh, generously donating or becoming a member. Uh, and we want to thank those of you that have done that. It's been uh, a joy with these videos to kind of connect uh, with people interested in Civil War medical care and, and joining us as we kind of draw lessons from, uh, from history. So thank you so much for those of you that have donated, those of you that have become members. Um, doing that helps us bring uh, you more quality program like this uh, while we're all uh, stuck inside. So uh, if you can give uh, a little, that's great. If you can give a lot, um, that's great too, but it's, uh, it means the world to us. Uh, those of you that have already given, become, become members, and it would be uh, wonderful if you, if you've been on the fence, if you've been enjoying our content, um, please uh, consider uh, becoming a member if you can. Uh, it helps us more than you know. So with all that said, uh, let's get started, talk about the Battle of Chancellorsville. Um, well, first things first, Nathan, tell us uh, a little bit about yourself and um, what kind of inspired you to, to write this blog post, which I should note is titled, Unspeakable Agony, Union Wounded Left Behind at Chancellorsville. It's a nice uh, cheery topic for us today. <laughs> yeah, very cheery. Uh, so just a little bit about myself. Um, I uh, have a master's in history and actually museum studies from the University of New Hampshire. Uh, so when I left grad school, I was kind of planning on doing a little more uh, public history, but I ended up moving down here to DC, uh, getting into the, uh, a position with the Army Center of Military History. Uh, so I wasn't doing as much public history, uh, but that also gave me an opportunity to start studying and writing about what I really love, which is uh, the Civil War. Uh, specifically, I've always really enjoyed studying New Hampshire's participation in the Civil War. And one of the first uh, one of the first topics that I started working on was actually the 12th New Hampshire's experience at Chancellorsville, mm. because I found that they had been uh, I was their sort of baptism by fire, their very first battle, and they were you know absolutely obliterated at Chancellorsville. They lost about I think it was like 72, 73 men, uh, killed or mortally wounded in only you know an hour or to uh, action. So that kind of intrigued me. And what also kind of intrigued me was reading all the accounts and uh, not only from the regiment, but also the uh, just other accounts of Chancellorsville. There's really like not much mention of the regiment. So in doing this research, I not only was reading, like I said, a lot of these primary sources from the, uh, the uh, reg people, the men of the regiment itself, but also regiments that were in the area. And in that I stumbled across uh, this memoir from a guy named uh, uh, Rice Bull. This is a copy of it here. It's actually called Soldiering. Uh, yeah, I don't that's think a pretty straightforward title there. Soldiers. Yeah, right. So it's not hard to find. It's edited by K. Jack Bauer, uh, the other Jack Bauer, I guess. <laughs> um, but I don't know if it's a print anymore, but it's still, I think, readily available. You can, <clears throat> excuse me, get it on Amazon, stuff like that, uh, whatever your local bookstore. Um, but this is actually a photo here of a full wartime photo. Um, but anyways, it's, it's, a, it's a great memoir. Uh, he wrote it after, long after the war using his diaries that he kept during, uh, during his service. And uh, anyways, I was just reading this account because he was actually nearby the 12th New Hampshire and uh, reading past the battle, I found this like horrific account of uh, his experience after the battle because he was wounded and left behind when the Union Army of the Potomac retreated uh, first away from his position and then back across the uh, the Rappahannock River. 
And he was just kind of left behind with, like he says, around 500 other men. And mm-hmm. their, uh, their just horrific experience of not really getting enough medical care for about a week after the battle uh, until they were finally evacuated back across the river to Union lines. Um, it just really, you know, it stunned me. And I was like, wow, this, you know, this is a, <laughs> something, something great to write about. Um, as and far as a story that that hasn't really been told very much, which is something we find a lot at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, a, a lot of uh, narratives of Civil War battles, um, you know, they focus on the battle itself, um, mm-hmm. but less so on what happens afterward, which, you know, Civil War battles leave staggering numbers of casualties behind and someone has to, you know, to care for these people. And, and that's one of the reasons why right. I find the study of Civil War medicine so compelling is it's just not a story that gets a lot of play, but it's extremely important as we're discovering now in the midst of a pandemic. Medical care is super important. Right. So, so you were drawn to that. But anyways, yeah, that's how that's how I kind of discovered this and got interested. Tangentially related to what I was researching, but uh, but it's a great memoir. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. And uh, so the Battle of Chancellorsville was was something that had inter- interested you prior to this. And uh, yeah, that, that's uh, how it can go sometimes. You get going down a rabbit hole and you discover something interesting that you didn't even, right. you didn't even plan to write about. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, let's start things off. Um, give us maybe just sort of a brief overview uh, of the Battle of Chancellorsville, um, just to get everyone in the, the right frame of mind to talk about what comes after the battle. Right. Uh, so try to kind of narrow it down here because chances are like most civil war battles and campaigns are complex. Uh, but essentially you had the uh, Union Army of the Potomac across the Rappahannock River in Fredericksburg in the late spring 1863 and then Lee's Army of Northern Virginia on the other side of the river uh, on the Fredericksburg side. And uh, General uh, Joseph Hooker took command uh, and he developed this kind of ambitious plan to essentially leave a force in Fredericksburg to deceive Lee into thinking that he was attacking there, and then send the majority of his army on this big flank uh, around, up and around across fords on the Rappahannock River and then the Rapidan River, and essentially get in um, into Lee's rear and kind of attack him, force him back to Richmond uh, and, and destroy his army. So they, uh, he executed this movement and basically on May 1st, he decided uh, instead of continuing to attack Lee because he engaged him uh, outside of Fredericksburg that day after the flanking movement was very successful. Um, Hooker basically contracted his army into a defensive position around the, uh, the intersection, the Chancellorsville intersection. And uh, then on May 2nd is when the uh, Lee sent Jackson's half of the army, uh, Stonewall Jackson's half of the army on the famous flank march uh, that basically struck the Union 11th Corps, their right flank, and kind of collapsed it and uh, rolled it up. And on the, uh, that evening, of course, is when Stonewall Jackson was mortally, eventually mortally wounded by his own men. Uh, and then Jeb Stewart, the cavalry commander, actually took command of Jackson's uh, corps, that half of the army. And uh, so on the kind of early morning of May 3rd, you have uh, Rice Bull, the soldier, who is in the uh, 123rd New York, which was in a uh, in the 12th Corps, the Union Army of the Dominic 12th Corps. And you have him basically on the morning of May 3rd confronting uh, Jeb Stewart's now in command of this half of Lee's army. And he's going to reopen the attack that Jackson's attack had kind of stalled out the night before. So you have... Uh, you have Bull just kind of waiting here with his regiment, waiting for the attack to come. So on the uh, early morning of May 3rd, it was a Sunday, uh, Stewart's men reopened the attack, and uh, it was uh, Bull's first major action. So uh, he talks about just how tense it was, you know, in particular for his regiment, because it was the first time they were in combat. And uh, he wasn't, I don't, I don't remember if he said how long he was in action, but at one point he said, you know, I, I had just pulled my gun up to my shoulder. And I think he said he had just fired. And then all of a sudden he felt this, uh, this sting on his face or, or he said, he said something hit his face, uh, but it didn't cause any pain. And then all of a sudden he said, you know, I felt blood running down my face and he didn't really think anything of it. Cause you know, you're in shock. You don't really feel the pain. 
a soldier next to him goes, hey, hey, buddy, I think you should go to the rear. You're bleeding pretty badly. <laughs> uh, so he gets up and he starts walking, you know, behind his regiment on the way to the rear. And then all of a sudden he says he, feel, he feels he gets hit by something in the, the hip in the back area. Uh, and then he falls over and he just blacks out. And that's all he remembers for who knows how long. Um, eventually comes to, and uh, I think there was an officer over, standing over him. And he says, uh, he thought he was dead at first. And then, you know, Bull comes to, and he's all covered in blood. And the officer's like, you know, we're going to get you a little bit to the rear, farther back to this little stream where a lot of dead and wounded were already lying from the Union lines. Um, and uh, Bull just kind of lies there. I think he passes out again. And eventually when he comes to, uh, he's kind of surprised because the entire army is gone. He's just, you know, there's no one there. It's quiet. All the firing's gone. And he's just left behind with these, with these hundreds of uh, these wounded just lying along the creek. And basically that's how. That's how the battle ends anyways for uh, for Rice Bowl. Yeah, I have to imagine that would be incredibly disorienting um, yeah. to, to kind of pass out in the midst of, you know, one of the most intense experiences, you know, of your life, you know, in the middle of a Civil War battle. And then mm -hmm. next thing you know, suddenly it's fairly quiet and you're like, where did everybody go? Yeah, and right. More importantly, why am I still here? Mm -hmm. um, so it's, so the, the Union Army ends up being driven from the field, right? Right, correct. Uh, and so Rice Bull and a number of, of other Union wounded, I think you said 500 or so, um, at least in this area, get left mm -hmm. behind. Right. And so what, what happens to them uh, from, from that point? Cause, uh, and I'll parlay this into another question. One of the most common questions we get at the museum is, did both sides treat people from the other side? Um, so what was Rice Bull's experience since now he's effectively in the hands of, or will be soon in the hands of Confederate doctors? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how, I mean, I think most of the time um, it really depended on who held the field uh, after the battle, whether you were caring for the other side's wounded. Uh, so in this case, you know, the Union Army didn't have to care for a lot of Confederate wounded because they retreated and they left all their wounded behind. So it was really the Confederate army uh, that had to care for all these Union, these men that were, that were left behind. And I'll note that uh, this fighting on the morning of May 3rd, which lasted about five hours, was actually one of the most ferocious of the war up and actually ever in the war, but even up until that point. So I think there were about 17,000 casualties between the two armies, so that's killed, wounded, uh, you know, missing, captured. Uh, just in about five hours. So up until that point, the only thing that surpassed that was Antietam. And that was, of course, an entire day. And that was, what, 22,000, 23,000 casualties between the two. So it was very ferocious. So there were a lot of dead and wounded of uh, both sides just lying on the field um, at, at, in that area around Chancellorsville. So Bull ended up, I think he lay there just where he fell uh, along the stream for the rest of May 3rd and then all the way into overnight into May 4th. And I think it was finally the end of May 4th that Confederates kind of came behind and they, you know, got the men that they could, uh, that they could move that weren't, you know, already dead or dying um, and carried them basically up this hill behind the, uh, the stream to what was called Fairview. And it's basically this giant open plain uh, that was a Union artillery position, at least at the start of the battle, until they were uh, they were driven back. Um, and they collected all the wounded around the uh, what was called the the Fairview cabin uh, up in the middle of the field. And of course, the cabin was really small, so they didn't really have a lot of room to house all the men, because uh, both said, like I said, I think there were about 500 just in this particular area that they uh, gathered there. Uh, but a lot of the men, they just kind of laid out in the field and they didn't have a lot of shelter. So that was what Bull's experience was uh, after the battle, after he was wounded anyways. Mm. And so, you know, uh, both sides are not going to, you know, ignore the wounded of the other side. I mean, th these are mm. doctors after all. They're not just going to watch somebody bleed out. But right. Sometimes um, they just don't have the resources to care for everybody. Mm -hmm. And I would have to imagine that given sort of equal severity of injury, 
uh, a Confederate doctor would probably treat a Confederate patient first. Um, and I don't, I don't know if or, or how many people have, you know, doctors from the time wrote down exactly that. Um, I, I don't know that if anyone was saying that, but just thinking about it, I would have to imagine that's how it would go. But eventually, um, Rice Bowl does get some, some medical treatment um, from right. other doctors. And I'll add that it's, uh, it's interesting. Bull never, so the, the, the memoir was written, you know, after the war, right? So yes, well, right spoiler after, alert, he survives. Yeah, right. Uh, so you always have to kind of take any memoir with a grain of salt because it's written so much, you know, so much distance has passed between the event and, you know, memory can be faulty. And uh, of course, you know, the, the, dis, uh, the major differences between history and memory. Uh, but in the memoir, at least, he does not have any, um, does not show any ill will towards the Confederates. Um, he always just kind of makes it seem like, you know, they, they just didn't have the supplies or the, the surgeons, not even, you know, or medical supplies or any food for us. Um, so I found it interesting that even, even in the memoir, he wasn't, but I, I always wonder if during the time that it happened, if maybe he was a little angrier, you know. Well, that, that I'm sure having an open wound is is liable to make you fairly grouchy. I would have to. Right, have. right, I'm sure. Uh, we've talked a, a, a little bit about this, but um, one of the things that, you know, I've noticed in, in my time working at the museum is that kind of each battle carries with it its own set of challenges for caring for the wounded. Um, mm -hmm. So what are some specific challenges that, that Chancellorsville brought to caring for the, the number of wounded? Uh, I think like we were saying, it was really just the lack of supplies on the Confederate side. And this is because, you know, the Confederate army was notoriously underfed, undersupplied anyways. Um, but also just the sheer number of wounded, like I said, you know, there were 17,000 casualties. And it's, if you've ever been to the Chancellorsville battlefield, um, it's a pretty relatively confined area um, that to have that many men killed or wounded uh, in a short period of time. So the Confederates, you know, had their own extreme casualties. Uh, it was a very costly victory to push the uh, Hooker's army back. So, uh, you know, they just didn't have the uh, the resources, I think, to be able to care for the Union wounded. And on the, on the other side, the Union army had, uh, up until the 6th, they were actually relatively close. They were in a new posi defensive position that was less than a mile from where Bull was, which must have been kind of frustrating for a few days for him. Mm -hmm. um, although he didn't, there's no way he could have known that at the time. But, uh, you know, they weren't able to, after that, they pulled back across Rappahannock and they weren't able to get uh, any, any medical care of any sort to these uh, wounded left behind until uh, I think it was May 5th. So two days after the, the battle, the main part of the battle on Bull's wounding were, uh, were they able to get any surgeons even at all to uh, help with, uh, with medical care. And, and really, and I can get to that a little later, but really most of that was just uh, amputations, uh, not really medical care per se, as we would consider it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now there, there are, so of course, what, and something else that jumped out at me, um, Chancellorsville of course is not a particularly urban area. So there's not a lot of shelter available. Uh, like mm -hmm. you're talking about the cabin. I mean, they can't put, a, uh, put everyone in there. And so, you know, right. they're sitting out under the, under the sun, which, you know, isn't, isn't really helping things. So, mm -hmm. um, that kind of being out in the middle of nowhere aspect to it um, raises its own set of challenges, especially if uh, they're too injured to be moved to right. you know, a nearby city. Yeah, the yeah the shelter was a a big problem because, like I said, they only had the cabin, and uh, basically they just laid all these men out in the field, which was uh, some of them had their tents, their shelter tents still, so they would. Uh, they would like stake out their tents and they would have a little bit of shelter. Others just had blankets or uh, their, their raincoats. Um, so they would just kind of lay the blankets on the ground and then like put the raincoats over them, something like that. Um, which was fine because Bull was saying that it was, uh, it was really nice weather at the time until mm -hmm. May uh, 6th, I believe. Uh, and then there was a massive thunderstorm that brought in rain that kind of lasted for a 
a couple of days. And this also contributed to the Union Army had trouble, uh, almost didn't get across, back across the Rappahan Rappahannock because of uh, flooding. Uh, but for the, the wounded men, it made you know life miserable, just mm -hmm. lying out exposed to the elements. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, but in addition to the, the um, Confederate doctors, there were um, individuals who were there that were kind of helping out, uh, notably, uh, and I didn't write down his first name, uh, Larman, who I, I think was a musician. Yeah, John, John Larman, I think, was a musician in, in Bull's Regiment. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Tom Ambrose, a uh, chaplain, mm -hmm. I think. Um, yeah. You know, you, you see characters like this on a number of Civil War battlefields, but just kind of talk about ways that they went about trying to ease the suffering of those who were there. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, the, the, the uh, Thomas Ambrose thing was actually kind of interesting because he was the chaplain of the 12th New Hampshire, who I was, you know, researching uh, at the time. So I thought it was interesting that you had Bull that remembered him specifically. Uh, mm -hmm. And he was, yeah, he stayed behind uh, along with John Larman, this musician from Bull's regiment. Uh, basically, they stayed behind and willingly were captured by the Confederates, even though they neither of them were wounded. Uh, they just stayed behind to uh, care for the Union wounded, uh, specifically their regiments, uh, because both of those two regiments had a lot of number of wounded, but they just helped uh, uh, helped out everyone that was there. And Bull was really appreciative. He just kind of considered them lifesavers. Uh, I think Ambrose, he called uh, one of the true heroes of Chancellorsville. Uh, so clearly all those years later, he was still very fond of, of the work that he had done. Uh, sadly, Ambrose was actually uh, killed in the uh, the lines outside Petersburg in, uh, I think, July 1864. Mm -hmm. um, so he didn't, didn't survive the war. But uh, yeah, they, so like I said, there was no, there were no surgeons there until May 5th. And even then they were just doing amputations. So there weren't a lot of medicines or anything available. Uh, to help the men. So really these guys were just trying to make the wounded men as comfortable as possible. Uh, they would, you know, help put the blank, spread blankets over them. Uh, they would spread, uh, uh, not spread, they would, uh, they would try and scrounge up food uh, because there was a lot of, you know, stuff left over the battlefield from bodies, you know, dead men and everything. They still had food in their haversacks. Uh, so they would kind of scrounge up food from across the battlefield, uh, any other blankets, you know, they could find just lying, lying on the field uh, and really just making these men as comfortable as possible because that's all they could do. Uh, one thing I, I found interesting too, as far as food, and I don't know if this is, this actually happened, but uh, Bull writes with authority that it did, but apparently the food situation got so dire um, that Ambrose actually, Chaplain Ambrose actually went to Jeb Stewart who was camped nearby and asked to uh, to get some food, but he said, "I I don't have any to spare. That's not my, my that's not my authority." Something like that. So Bull says that the chaplain actually went all the way to General Lee and asked him for food, and Lee apparently um, provided like a wagon of food or something like that. So I I don't know if that actually happened, but you know he he wrote that it did. Um, it, cer it certainly speaks to the the need um, for food right. that was there. Yeah, and they didn't. Um, they still didn't have a lot of food. Uh, Bull himself, because he was wounded in his cheek, uh, you know, he was shot through his cheek and it came out through his, through his neck. Mm. Um, he was unable to open his mouth really, I think because of dried blood and just, uh, just I think the wound wouldn't allow him to move his mouth. Um, so he was only, he was talking about he only was able to sip coffee and kind of uh, like sip this like cornmeal mush that they made. Mm. Um, for like a week. I mean, that's all he ate. So I'm not even sure how he survived during that time. Um, but that, that's, that's, that's how they, that's what these two men were doing. We're just, you know, making these guys as comfortable as possible because that's, it, it was just kind of agonizing to read this, uh, you know, it was agonizing for them and it was agonizing to read about these men just lying out in the field, just, you know, full says and wounded in horrible ways. Um, you know, all the ways that a Civil War weaponry could damage a human body, and these guys are just lying there on the elements, basically just waiting to die for the most of them. Um, so it's, I, I, it, it's very saddening to read, um, even, even now.
Mm -hmm. Now, th this certainly is a, a bleak picture of Civil War medicine, but it wasn't always so <laughs> dire, especially when, uh, you know, the armies were better supplied and, and, and things like this. This is, uh, I would imagine, probably one of the more severe instances uh, of medical care in the aftermath of a battle. Right, yeah, that's, I mean, it's the worst that I've ever read. Of course, I'm not, you know, an expert. I've read every account of every everyone's experience of medical care after the bat after a battle but uh yeah it's, it's pretty horrific mm -hmm. um so obviously the the story of of rice bowl um you know it's it's instructive it's illustrative um but i would imagine that there are probably some people out there that say well it's just one story what can it really teach us uh, about mm -hmm. everything so as a as a historian what in your mind is is useful about um, kind of telling individual stories and kind of focusing in on like a micro level? Uh, I think that it just, uh, it really helps us to understand uh, that the war was made up of individual experiences. Um, I mean, yeah, you have the macro level of things going on, but uh, for these men that were here, the agony that they went through uh, was very important to them. Um, and I think because of that, uh, you know, it was really important to Bull. Uh, because of that, I think it's, it's important for us to study because it, it gives us an idea of, of um, kind of puts a human face on the war and gives us a better idea of, of, of what they went through. Uh, so I'll note too that um, I thought it was interesting that Bull seemed to, even writing this memoir after the war, he seemed to kind of think that nobody would believe that it happened. Um, I don't know if he would think that other soldiers wouldn't believe him or just the general public wouldn't believe him because so much time had passed um, and, you know, the nation had you know, reconciled over the war. Uh, but he kept writing these quotes about how uh, I'll just I'll just read a couple of my thought were interesting, but basically trying to prove that um, prove that hey this actually happened. I know you might not believe me, uh, but he says one of them is I must leave it to your imagination, for I cannot describe these awful conditions, uh, which were made worse by the stench from the dead men and horses. Uh, none of the men and horses had been buried. The horses lay where they died. The men lay in a row side by side south of the cabin in sight of all wounded. And here's another uh, that, one. That's that's a very interesting quote for a variety of reasons. But I um, earlier a few weeks ago had a, a conversation with uh, another historian, uh, Dr. Melissa DeValvis, and we were talking about uh, Civil War nurses and how they wrote about kind of the intense, you know, trauma that they experienced. And mm -hmm. she she and one of the questions I'd asked her is, you know, how did they talk about the, their experiences to people at home and she said the longer they were in the field the less they felt they were able to do so kind of because they're missing this kind of common frame of reference and it kind of sounds like that's where mm -hmm. where rice bowl is and the other thing that she noted is that almost everyone um commented on the smell uh, yeah of things so it's interesting that that also kind of jumped out of that quote to me there mm -hmm. Yeah, and just one that's similar. He says, one, another one, uh, one reading about our camp might think I was exaggerating, for no one who is not there could imagine the conditions. Wounds of every conceivable kind, the agony of mortally wounded men who lingered without death or without aid until death came. Mm. But it, it just really, uh, getting back to, to the question, it just, just how important this was to him and how much it stuck with him. And, and he really, he, I think it was like the worst experience of the war for him. Now he eventually recovered from his wounds uh, and went on to, uh, since he was in the 12th Corps, the, when the 12th and the 11th Corps went out uh, to Tennessee to uh, reinforce uh, the uh, forces in Chattanooga. And then of course he served with uh, uh, Sherman through the, the Atlantic campaign and the March to the Sea. But they really stuck with him because he was talking about the operating place uh, where the surgeons were just, you know, up, removing arms and legs and just throwing them in a pile really in, in sight of all these guys just lying there because there's nowhere for them to, to go 
Uh, he says this operating place with its bloody cupboard door, uh, because they were using a cupboard door as, as the operating table. Mm -hmm. Its bloody surgeons with the stack of human arms and legs thrown behind them was an awful sight that cannot dim from one's memory. Right, right. And, you know, amputations are a useful and, and a a good procedure that surgeons do. That's one of the things that we try, the myths that we try and bust that surgeons were unskilled and that amputations mm -hmm. were more of a waste. There's all kinds of very good reasons they're doing this, um, mostly because Civil War ammunition is so damaging to the human body. Um, right. But performing those in sight of other people uh, definitely has a demoralizing um, effect. Um, yeah, because there's no, nowhere for them to go. Exactly, like you said. Mm -hmm. um, it, I think it's interesting that you note that, you know, he, he is expressing, you know, how important this, this was to him. And, you know, on a very kind of basic human level, I, I have to imagine reading these, you know, telling these individual stories, you know, if something's important to someone, you know, they want to pass it on and, you know, certain things don't stick with everybody. But, you know, just the idea of communicating something that's important to someone and kind of continuing that story, I think is uh, an important and good sort of human responsibility. Mm -hmm. That right. makes sense. That, that's, you know, talking in a very grand philosophical way, but I think there's something to that. Mm -hmm. um, one sort of final question that uh, I meant to ask earlier um, that I think people might find of interest. Uh, what was the fate of the the Union soldiers who are treated by these Confederate doctors? I mean, there's the immediate initial interest of humanity. We want to stop people from dying and things like that. But once, you know, once they're recovered, are, are they prisoners? What's the, or are they just sent home? What's the, the status there? So they actually lucked out in Bull's case uh, on May 12th. So, you know, over a week since, almost 10 days since the battle happened, uh, they actually arranged a sort of truce and the, uh, the Union Army sent a wagon train across the river and they were able to pick up, I don't know if all of them, um, I assume most of them, maybe just the most seriously wounded. Uh, I don't know, maybe the ones that weren't as wounded were, were taken captive. Uh, but they were loaded them into a wagon train and they basically just took them back across the river. So in Bull's case, those men were actually lucky that they didn't end up having to go to a prison camp. And, you know, you, you would think that if he did go to a prison camp, he may not have survived uh, the war because the, the care just would not have been there, uh, especially with the, you know, notorious condition of a lot of Civil War prisons. Um, so in that case, they were lucky that he was able to go back to, to friendly lines and actually get um, taken care of. And I think he went home for a time, too, to, to recuperate. Mm -hmm. but, but under other circumstances, if that wasn't able to work out, that's that's where the Union soldiers would have wound up, if you, you say? Right. Yeah, right. As, as uh, prisoners. Got it. Yeah, it's, uh, it, you know, it, it's interesting that the Civil War, there, there's no kind of codified international humanitarian law or, or things like that. I mean, right. they kind of practice some of that. Um, during the Civil War, but we're, we're not quite all the way there. Like, for example, um, you know, doctors, you know, being able to kind of come and go and acting as sort of neutral parties. I mean, there's a little bit of that. There's the famous example of the Winchester Accords, which you can read about on our, our blog as well. Um, but that wasn't adopted wholly across the board. Um, so Civil War is kind of an interesting in-between space. Uh, um, with regards to that as well. Right, still a long ways to go. Yeah. Uh, well, to, to close, uh, is there, is there a, a hopeful quote maybe that, uh, that stuck out to you? Uh, one, of yeah. the, one of the things we've been trying to underscore during the, this time of COVID-19 is that uh, there is hope to be found in history. And mm -hmm. you know, this is, uh, like we were saying, the title of your, your blog post is Unspeakable Agony, but um, I, I'd like to end on a, a hopeful note here. Yeah, after all this horrific talk of bloodshed and, and horrible, you know, conditions. Uh, so I don't really have a hopeful quote, but there was a hopeful situation that I thought was interesting uh, that sort of resonated with Bull is that there was a Confederate soldier that actually uh, originally found him when he was still down by the creek. And he helped him, he made a cane for him out of a stick because Bull couldn't walk because of his hip being shot. Uh, 
and he helped Bull and others get up to the up the hill to Fairview. And then the soldier apparently just kept caring for him uh, and others and, and talking with him and everything for the next week or so. And uh, Bull was really grateful for that, of course. Uh, the soldier said that, I don't, I don't know if he ever figured out what regiment he's from, um, but he said he was an Irish immigrant who had come to, I don't know, from South Carolina maybe. Um, and he, according to Bull anyways, he said that he didn't really care about the war. He just got enlisted because everyone else was doing it. And now he's just uh, decided to stay in because he was, uh, you know, had already started, you know, was going to see it through. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, you know, that's a topic for a whole other thing about soldier motivations. Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, Bull was really grateful for this guy and he he was kind of considering him his friend. And, and funny story, he actually, when they went down to Tennessee, uh, he actually ended up running into the guy again because he had been captured during the attack on, uh, during the Battle of Chattanooga, I think on, I think he was on Missionary Ridge. Mm -hmm. uh, and he just randomly ran into him, which, you know, what are the odds of all these hundreds of thousands of men in the war? Uh, and these two aren't, these two men ended up switching theaters, going from the Eastern to the Western theater. Uh, and then they ended up seeing each other again. Although after that, Bull says that he never, you know, never saw him again or heard from him. Uh, but he said that he kept the cane that he made out of the stick. Mm -hmm. um, he said that he kept that cane for the rest of his life. Um, be interested to know if the family still has that or whatever, or what, what happened to it. But anyways, that's kind of a hopeful story. Yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, you know, so you know. Bless those individuals going around in those really, really awful situations and, and doing their part. Uh, and even kind of like you said, even just talking with, with the men, because I mean, especially when you can't really go anywhere, um, which we're experiencing in a very limited right. way today, but you know, there's a certain amount of boredom, um, people just sitting there. So the, the blessing of even just talking to, to people. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. The, so Thanks for that. Thanks for uh, coming on today and, and talking yeah, about this. Me. And uh, to all of you watching, uh, if you uh, enjoyed this uh, or any of our other digital content, please consider uh, donating or becoming a member of the museum. Uh, it helps us continue to bring uh, content like this to you. And uh, stay tuned for more to come. Be sure to like our Facebook page uh, and subscribe to our YouTube channel for, for more good stuff like this. And uh, we'll see you next time.